Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Christy. I'm a part of the Student Doctor Network team. Um, we really appreciate you being here this evening and taking some time out of your evening to spend with us. Tonight we have Dr. Jessica Friedman, Dr. Lisa Pilch, and Ms. Lori Tanzi from MedEdits Medical Admissions. MedEdits is the nation's leading medical school admissions counseling company, advising students comprehensively through all stages of the medical admissions process. All MedEdits advisors are former med school faculty who served on medical school and residency admissions committees, education committees, and hospital committees. All of these women with us this evening have extensive and impressive resumes, but for the sake of time, I'll just give a brief introduction to each of them. Dr. Jessica Friedman is a board-certified practicing emergency physician. She served in the residency leadership and on the medical school admissions committee at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in 2008 when she left to found MedEdits, where she has guided hundreds of med school, residency, and fellowship hopefuls through the application process. Dr. Lisa Pilch is an emergency physician in Chicago, Illinois. She earned her MD from Rush Medical College in Chicago, where she has also served as a clinical instructor, assistant professor, and on the medical school admissions committee. She also holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And Lori Tanzi has worked in various aspects of medical education for her entire career. With a background in counseling psychology, she has worked in the medical education departments at Feinberg Northwestern School of Medicine, University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine, and the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She was a faculty member at Mount Sinai and served as assistant dean of student affairs. She also served in key roles on the medical school admissions committee at Feinberg Northwestern and Mount Sinai. We'll start this evening with a presentation on what you need to know about the medical school interview. And then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. Throughout the presentation, if you have questions, you can submit those in the question box in the control panel on the right of your screen. Uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation. Um, MedEdits team, thanks so much for being with us this evening. From here, I'll turn things over to you guys. Great. Thank you so much for having us, and thank you for that terrific introduction. Okay. So just some basics about the medical school admissions process. And really these basics are, are really fundamental. And in fact, when I was reviewing these slides yesterday with uh, my daughter who happens to be in the third grade, she said, mommy, that's not medical. That's what they teach us in school. And, and really she's right. You know, there really isn't um, a lot that's very sophisticated about doing well in this process. You need to remember when you go on your medical school interviews that you are literally in a fishbowl. Everyone is watching you, everyone is you know, judging you, and everyone is forming impressions of who you are and what you're about. So it's really important during the entire day to be kind to everyone, to be respectful, to look everybody in the eye, and to really be engaged in whatever it is that you are doing. Um, talk to people, be friendly. You know, so if you are, for example, on um, a tour given by you know whoever that may be a medical student or an administrator be engaged in that tour show that you're interested you know be nice to the secretaries everyone is going to have input with regards to your overall candidacy this includes ancillary staff you know people who you may not consider important everybody in this process is extremely important and so it's just important to kind of treat everybody as you would like to be treated The next thing is first impressions make a huge difference. You want to make a good first impression. Not only does that mean that you want to be clean shaven or you want to have, you know, your, your hair needs to be neat and you need to be well dressed, but you want to look like a professional. You want to sound like a professional. So you need to sort of envision, well, what would a doctor look like to me? And how would a doctor sound to me? And you want to be that person. Once you make an impression, it is very difficult to change that impression, and this is something called the halo effect. So if someone has a very positive impression, it's going to take a lot of work on your part to change that to something negative. And by the same token, if you make a negative impression, it's going to be pretty difficult to change that impression to something positive. So along these same lines, the way that you carry yourself is extremely important. And I talk a lot about this with the students that I'm working with who are preparing for their interviews. 
um, I think you really need to think about you know, the state of mind that you're in as you approach your interview day or the interview season. You know, think about if you're in a good place, if you have things at school or at work organized, taken care of, if things are in order, and, um, and you can go in feeling confident and really enjoy your interview day. This energy that you bring to the interview experience should be really positive because people really will remember how they felt around you. Um, they'll remember a little bit about what you say, but more about how they felt in your presence. So, you know, just kind of think about how am I doing? You know, think about your state of mind as you approach your interview day and go there ready to be fully engaged, enthusiastic, ready to learn and have fun. And, and I, think, I think that's pretty important. I mean, something I always tell students is the interview days are fun. They are, you know, you're there to meet people. Um, you're being fed. You're listening to presentations. And if you're enjoying yourself, people can tell that you're enjoying yourself. So you, you sort of want to have this overall positive energy and that that is contagious um, and people will sense it. So you just sort of want to be perceived as being someone who overall is just kind of a positive, interested, engaged person. Professionalism during interviews is so important. Everyone is just connected to their phones. And during interviews, you just have to put the phones away. You don't want to be checking texts. You don't want to be checking emails. You don't want to be texting your friends. You don't want to be looking things up on the, on the internet. You certainly don't want to be Googling your interviewers. And this is something else that I really encourage. Some people say, well, should I Google my interviewer so I'm prepared and so I can ask them intelligent questions? No one is expected to, you know, no one expects you to know anything about your interviewers that day. And we'll talk a little bit more about that since your interviewers can change without you being aware. So you, you really want to put the phones away, you know, put them on vibrate and don't take them out for the entire day because you really want to be perceived as being a professional. There are two significant or two major types of interviews, um, the traditional interview and the multiple mini interview. The traditional interview is a one-on-one -on -one interview and that is the type of interview that is still conducted at the vast majority of medical schools. Um, however, many more schools um, every year are moving towards the MMI interview, um, and we will talk more about the MMI interview. The traditional interview, your standard one-on-one -on -one interview, you and another faculty member or a student or even an administrator, a dean. Sometimes people think only doctors interview medical school applicants, but that is not the case. Um, there are many other people who participate in this process who are not physicians. These interviews are typically conversational. Ideally, they are conversational. Um, however, each interviewer will have his or own, her own style of how they conduct an interview. And it's important that you as an applicant, when you walk in there, that you try to get a sense of that interviewer's style. Um, no two interviews are ever the same. And so it's, it's vital that you, know, you kind of go in there and you sort of get a sense of what's your interviewer's approach. Are they someone who likes to ask questions? Are they someone who likes to listen? Um, and that you sort of try to adapt to that approach. Now, I've, in my book that I wrote called The Medical School Interview, I've sort of broken down um, the different styles of interviews, interviewers, and I'm not going to go through all of those in tremendous detail here, and I do encourage you to read the book to kind of get a, a better sense of those, but I'm just going to discuss this briefly. The mentor and the professor, in my opinion, these are two ideal interviewer types, and why is that? The mentor is typically a very experienced medical educator, someone who loves students, someone who loves to nurture students. The professor is typically someone who's very seasoned. You know, they might look old and intimidating to a young medical student, but in typically they actually are very supportive of medical students and they enjoy doing this. These types of interviewers are going to be the friendliest. They're going to be the, in some ways, the easiest, and um, you know, and they're going to kind of have an idea of what they need to know from you as a medical school applicant. Not all interviewers are experienced, and this also comes as a tremendous surprise to pre-medical students. We as faculty get you know, very little to no training on how to interview medical school applicants. So someone who has a tremendous amount of experience in interviewing applicants is actually the ideal interviewer to have. The question shooter. 
This is someone who just wants to fire questions, boom, 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 one after another. Sometimes they actually might be doing this by looking at your application and by going through your experiences. And with a question tree, you just want to answer those questions. Very, very rarely um, you will get an inappropriate interviewer, someone who asks you about your sexual orientation, your religious you know, preferences. This is so rare, I don't think it's really even worth spending a ton of time on. Um, the egomaniac is someone who really would rather talk about themselves than talk about you. Um, when you get an interviewer like this, it's best to try to steer the conversation back to you, try to bring up things that um, you know are important regarding your candidacy. The strong silent type, a listener. There are some interviewers, they really want to listen. And so if you if you get a listener, it's it's important to sort of not to ramble, because that's sometimes a tendency when you get someone who isn't maybe so assertive and asking you questions. So if you get a strong silent type, just be careful that you're not being too repetitive, too redundant, and you're not rambling. The replacement, all right, this happens all the time, right? You're, this is medicine, there are emergencies. People who were supposed to be interviewing last minute, oh my gosh, I can't interview, something came up, okay? So sometimes you're gonna get someone who's been, who just you know, ran into that, into the office, they grabbed your file, they know nothing about you, and you know, they actually are sort of annoyed because you've just sort of interrupted their day, even though it's not your fault. So just kind of be aware of that, that there's a lot of different circumstances that play into who interviews you. The student interviewer um, is sort of a unique type of interviewer, and I used to be, when I was on faculty, I used to be a huge fan of student interviewers, but since I've now been on this side of things and I've heard from applicants sort of some of the conversations that take place doing, during st student interviews, I don't know if I'm a huge fan of, of student interviewers anymore, simply because the students really have very little, no experience interviewing. They don't know sort of what they're supposed to find out about the applicant. They don't know what types of questions they're supposed to be asking. And I find that sometimes student interviews tend to veer off topic to very inappropriate subjects, like, you know, where are the parties, where are the bars, you know. So it's it's vital when you have a student interviewer to try to veer the conversation back towards what you know is important about your experiences, why you want to be a doctor. And, you know, and, and just, but at the same time, it's important also to keep in mind that a student interviewer has influence. So they, they potentially are a voting member on the admissions committee, so even though they may have no idea what they're doing, their opinion is still going to count significantly when everyone's deciding about whether to accept waitlist or reject you. I was just going to chime in regarding the student interviewer here. In my experience, they were extremely valuable, but also quite um, tough evaluators and quite um, tough assessors. So if it starts to feel pretty casual, just make sure that you keep it professional. Don't let yourself get too comfortable because they tend to be pretty tough um, in terms of the numbers. They, they grade, if you will, a bit lower. Um, and they also feel that they really know who will thrive in that medical school environment because they're in it. And so they may have a very different perspective than your faculty interviewer. So I think there, there is a place for them and they, they can add a lot of value. Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of chime in on that. Okay, so wh what are the keys for success in, in doing well in an interview? And you know, what I, what I tell people is once you've gotten to the interview stage, you know that you have the academic credentials, you know you have the endorsements from your letter writers that have gotten you to this place. So what you need to do to be successful is you want to be authentic. You want to answer questions um, thoughtfully. You want to be introspective. It's also really important to go into every interview assuming that your interviewer doesn't know anything about you. All right? There, there are, usually, are typically two types of scenarios here. Either the interviewer has read everything about you, they know every piece of your application, or they haven't looked at anything and they're reviewing a file while you're sitting in front of them. And don't be offended if that happens because everyone is just so busy they don't necessarily have time to review an application before they sit down with an applicant. Um, but regardless of the scenario, regardless of, of whether an interview is blind or not blind, I encourage every applicant to walk into each interview as though the interviewer doesn't know anything about them, okay? Because what I'm doing as an interviewer, when I interview someone, even if I have read their application, 
is I'm making sure that the application matches the person sitting in front of me. We all know that people sometimes you know, get others to help them with their application. Sometimes that help is a little bit um, aggressive <laughs> and maybe it doesn't necessarily really reflect who they are. It doesn't necessarily like, reflect their viewpoints or their thoughts and ideas. So I'm making sure that whatever I'm reading on paper is sort of matching the person sitting in front of me. You also don't want to make your interviewer work too hard. The, the worst thing that can happen is when you have an applicant and you ask them a question and they just give you, you know, two word responses or they just give you a couple of sentences and that kind of forces me to sort of keep thinking of more and more questions to ask you, right? So you ideally want to turn this into as much of a conversation as possible and you want to make your interviewer's job as easy as possible as well. Um, you know, sometimes students will say, well, how long should I talk for? I've heard I should only speak for three minutes, all right? And I say there's no real rules on this. You want to talk for what seems to be an appropriate length of time, all right? And this is why just paying attention to social cues, paying attention to your interviewer, kind of getting a sense of are they engaged in what you're saying? Are they, are they paying attention to you? Are you keeping their attention? Are they getting bored, okay? So, you, you know, a lot of this in terms of how long you should speak has to do with that dynamic between you and your interviewer, all right? I tell everyone, you never memorize responses. You know, you, you know, everyone's always, you know, kind of trying to find out what are the questions they're going to ask me, okay? And then they write out what their responses are going to be. You never memorize responses. It, it's, it, you don't want to sound rehearsed. You want your interview to be fluid. You want it to be natural, okay? However, you do want to go into an interview knowing what are the highlights of your candidacy what distinguishes you as an applicant. And it's also important to listen. Sometimes students won't listen to the question that's being asked. They have such an agenda, sort of a prescribed agenda in their mind that they, they're trying to throw out all that information and they're not even really listening to what's being asked of them. So, you know, this is about good communication skills. You want to listen, you want to answer what's being asked, and you want to be paying attention to your interviewer so you can sort of you know, go with whatever flow they're dictating. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people show and don't tell. This is something that we, you know, advise a lot for documents as well. You know, you don't want to say I'm hardworking and, um, you know, I, I, um, I'm really good at this or this or this. You want to show them. You want to use your experiences to illustrate what qualities and characteristics you possess. So as much as you can, use anecdotes, you know, use stories from your own experience. This offers evidence for, you know, the fact that you possess all of these qualities and characteristics that medical school admissions committees are seeking, okay? And I call this practicing evidence-based admissions. Whether it's your written documents or whether it's an interview, you want to offer evidence for whatever point it is that you're trying to prove, okay? Be reflective, be introspective, all right? You, you want your answers to be smart, okay? But you also want them to sort of, to come from your heart and you want them to be genuine, all right? Be humble. None of us can stand someone who just thinks way too highly of themselves. This is, you know, not a very good indicator for, you know, being a physician since, you know, we all need to know our limitations as doctors. So make sure you go in and you're humble and try to the best of your ability to connect with your interviewer. This isn't always going to happen and that's okay and it's not as if you're going to get along with everybody whom you meet on the interview trail, but try to connect with them to some degree. Even if this isn't someone you might be friends with, you can probably connect with them on some level. And above all, you know, I always tell people just go with the flow. You can't predict what's going to happen. You can't predict what the exact conversation is going to be. You can't predict what the exact topics are going to be. So, you know, sort of just kind of try to go with the flow with each of your interviewers. I think this is where I just want to also remind you guys that this interview is about you. And you wrote up your AMP test, your Comus application. And just remember that the interviewers are asking about you. So while we've given you all this advice, the reality of it is, is that um, you actually already pretty much have every answer that they're to any question that they're going to ask you because they are interested in getting to know you. But I completely agree with Dr. Friedman in that um, you still do have a job to do during the course of this interview and to make sure that that's exactly what happens, that they do learn about you and that they don't have to drag this out of you. So um, take snippets from your AMTAS, integrate them into a story, 
and essentially take on the role of teacher and teach them about you so that whether this is somebody who has read your application five times or somebody who just picked it up five minutes ago gets a full and complete um, picture of the absolutely well-rounded, wonderful candidate that you are. All right, some things to remember. Um, they aren't going to remember your specific answers unless you say something that is just absolutely outrageous, okay? They're going to kind of remember the general gist of who you are and what you're about and kind of what experiences impress them the most. The thing you need to remember the most is your interviewer is your advocate, all right? And this is especially important with one-on-one -on -one interviews, all right? When everyone is sitting behind the scenes, you know, discussing all the applicants that were interviewed, you know, that day or that week, um, your interviewer is the one who is going to say, oh my gosh, you know, this, this Sarah Smith, she was incredible. I loved her. She's a great student, but she also has amazing experiences in public health, and she, she wants to be a primary care physician, and she wants to do public health research. Okay, the, I realize this is a completely ideal applicant, okay, of which there are very few, <laughs> but, um, you know, your interviewer is the one who's going to sell you to the admissions committee. The interviewer is also the, the one who's going to explain your red flags, who's going to say, yeah, you know what? Um, you know, he got an eight on verbal, but you know, I, his, his writing is so phenomenal and he got a letter of reference from the English teacher, which is great. And he got 11s on both the sciences. And so, you know what, I, I, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I think he's going to be a great addition to the class. So your interviewer is the one who's going to sell you to the admissions committee. And if, if your interviewer sells you, it's unlikely that someone who did not meet with you is going to completely contradict that and say, oh, but I found this on the application and I don't like this guy, you know. So it's really important to realize your interviewer is the one who's going to basically get you admitted, okay. And at schools, this is a little bit of pressure, but at schools, let's say they just have one, you know, traditional interview for the entire interview day that can be a little scary because basically you're relying on one advocate versus when let's say you have two or three interviews and I think all of us have been in situations where in the you know where maybe one interviewer thinks an applicant is amazing and another interviewer has some major problems and you know they'll go to battle in, in these sort of behind the scenes meetings um, you know over applicants so it, it's just really important to realize your interviewer is on your side okay and they want to like you they want you to do well you know they they're not looking to sort of to get you and to make this a really difficult and horrible experience um, I also tell people interview days are exhausting. You know, you are on for the whole day. You are in that fishbowl. You are smiling. You are, you know, being nice to everybody. You are being interested. And that's an exhausting process. So when you leave at the end of an interview day, if you're not tired, maybe you weren't sort of invested enough in that day, all right? Everyone's going to have a bad interview, okay? And, and this is, you know, there's so many things that influence how an interview progresses. That interviewer might have had a really horrible day themselves and are taking it out on you. Or you might remind them of their cousin they just can't stand at all. Um, you know, so there, there's so many things that, that will influence how an interview progresses. So when you have a really bad interview, just say, okay, I had a bad interview. And try to evaluate it objectively. Try to say, well, was there anything I could have done to have made that interview better? Or was, I, was this just bad interview luck? And, and I tell everyone, you're going to have bad interview luck sometime during the season. Um, never, ever be disrespectful. That includes you don't roll your eyes. You don't act like you're better than everyone or like you're elitist. Or, oh, I went to, the, you know, to this school as an undergraduate. You know, where did you go? All right, everybody is your friend on interview day. All right. You also want to be engaged. Never, never look bored. Never again pull out that cell phone. All right. Never lose your attention. And also never interview your interviewer unless your interviewer brings something up about themselves. Um, you don't want to be asking your interviewer questions about who they are. All right. So, like, if some interviewer, let's say, starts talking about their research, then it's fair game maybe to have a conversation about their research. But otherwise, don't ever turn the tables on your interviewer and start interviewing them. So, you know, just sort of the take-home lesson here is a traditional interview is not rocket science, and there really aren't any major secrets to success. Um, as long as you are a good person, as long as you have good interpersonal skills, um, you're going to do well in this process. Um, you know, this a lot of this is just about, you know, again, sort of behaving in, in the way that you were taught and hopefully learned to behave when you were in elementary school. 
um, rarely are people asked medical questions, right? So this is just about your interviewers trying to get to know you, who you are, what your qualities and characteristics are, and why you want to be a doctor and what you have done to pursue your interest in medicine. The other type of interview is the MMI or the multiple mini interview and again more and more schools are moving towards the multiple mini interview which you know is sort of like speed dating interviews. And these are scenario based interviews where typically you're going to have you know anywhere from let's say five to eight stations you're going to be allowed eight minutes per station and each at each of those stations you're going to have either a scenario presented to you or you're going to be given a task or you're going to be asked to you know do some role play or you might even have a traditional station okay these are your they they're conducted each in distinct rooms typically you're going to have one interviewer in each of those rooms and you're going to be given your scenario outside the door which you're going to be allowed to review before you then go in and discuss the scenario with the interviewer all right the vast majority of these scenarios are not medical. No one expects you to have medical knowledge when you're going on the MMI interview. All right? These interviews are also conducted by doctors, but also by administrators. At some school, they're conducted by patients. Um, you know, so this is really a much better rounded type of interview, and it also um, allows for less bias than the multiple than the traditional interview, right? Because you're having multiple interviewers um, kind of get a sense of who you are and talk to you, all right? A lot of U.S. schools also have what, what I think of as hybrid MMI interviews. This is still very new in the States, and so some schools really aren't necessarily comfortable with it, and the faculty aren't really necessarily comfortable with it. So what some schools do is they'll have some MMI stations, but they'll also have some traditional one-on-one -on -one stations mixed in as well, where you'll get the basic questions like, tell me about yourself, why medicine, things of that nature. Um, so what are these interviews evaluating? They're really evaluating non-cognitive characteristics. They're evaluating your ability to put your shoes in another human being. They're, they they want to know are you compassionate? What are your values? Are you altruistic? And really they want to know how you communicate. You know, are you a good listener? Are you a good talker? Right. So when you're given a task station where you're asked to you know do something or when you're asked to explain to someone else how to do a simple task they want to know that you can communicate effectively but they also want to know that you can listen effectively and they also want to know how you react and are you professional All right so th these interviews are really evaluating some some very basic non-cognitive characteristics and a lot of applicants love the MMI and for them it's a really easy interview I mean if you're a good person and you know generally speaking extroverts tend to do better at the MMI and they're more comfortable with the MMI um, but if you have good values and good ideals this is not a tough type of interview and some applicants really love them So how, how are you evaluated when you are um, going through an MMI interview? Typically, you're going to be presented with some type of scenario that involves some type of very general issue. They want to know, can you understand the issue? Can you understand and demonstrate a comprehensive understanding of the topic or the issue that's being presented? Can you understand sort of the perspective of each person that might be involved in this scenario? They also want to know, can you reason? Can you problem solve? Are you able to sort of understand? And, you know, again, are you authentic, compassionate, and mature? You know, are, are you going to, you know, sort of be biased in your approach to a certain issue, or are you going to be more open-minded and understanding? And this is sort of an approach that we developed, and, you know, and I, I don't like people going into MMI interviews, you know, kind of, again, memorizing this approach, but I think it's just a good way to sort of initially start um, to start working through the MMI and, and we call this the Cytolog approach where when you walk into um, to an MMI and you've read your scenario you first summarize the scenario you identify who's involved in this scenario who are the people that are um, sort of most significant in the scenario you discuss the issues and you discuss them at length and you try to see the issues from the perspective of each of the players and in doing so you show empathy you show understanding all right if there's a specific question that's being asked, you answer that question, all right? 
then it's about dialogue. Then your interviewer is going to have a question about the scenario. Listen to the interviewer, okay? Also offer evidence, what we talked about before. You know, if you have some sort of experience that is related to this issue, bring in your own anecdotal experience, okay? Because that really shows a deeper understanding of the issues that are involved. And again, go with the flow, all right? You know, MMI interviews and each of these scenarios is going to be, you know, sort of about a conversation and about a dialogue. So let that dialogue happen. So how do you prepare? First of all, of course, you read you read the book, the medical school interview, um, which which I wrote, and hopefully there will be a new edition coming out soon that will also cover the MMI. Um, but you also you practice, practice, practice. You know whether you decide to work with MedEdits and we're actually offering a 30% discount on mock interviews um, through um, I think November 15th to SDN members. Um, you know you can practice with us. You can practice with um, a friend. You can practice with your college advising service, um, your pre-med advisor, you know, but you want to practice without memorizing. You don't want to practice too much. I do tell people sort of once you get to the point where you're memorizing responses, you, you want to stop practicing at that point. Review your application. Know what's on there. Know what experiences you potentially are going to be asked about and sort of don't have expectations. Go in, you know, realizing that, you know, each interview is going to have its own flow and its own sort of unique rhythm and, you know, kind of don't be rigid in your own expectations when you walk into an interview. And we thank you very much. And I guess we can now move to questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for sharing everything there. We have a bunch of questions come in. And just as a reminder, um, if you do have questions, you can submit them in the questions box uh, on the right side of your screen there on the control panel. Um, our first question is, if the tour with the interview is optional and I attended last year, would it reflect poorly if I didn't attend the second time? So I can lead off. Uh, I would say <laughs> that there's an opportunity here to, to learn something new, certainly. Um, you, you'll have different tour guides. They may take you to new parts of campus or new facilities that have opened. Um, it's, it's an opportunity to spend some time with the medical students on the tour. And so I would say, unless you really can't be away from your job or you have a really important reason that you couldn't go on the tour, um, you should absolutely attend the tour. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And and not only might you learn something new, but you don't know who toured you last year. You know, this is about showing interest. Um, and by not participating in all the activities that are offered to you, you are basically saying I'm not interested or I'm too good for the tour. I don't think it's really optional. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> optional on interviews. Right. For somebody who spent years organizing these days, I, I don't. I don't think that they are optional. Yeah. Um, I also wouldn't want you, as the applicant, to actually have to explain why. I agree with Lori, which is if there's an emergency, you seriously, you, you've got to go catch a plane, something like that. Okay, maybe, but for any other reason, I mean, do you really want to spend your day talking about, well, I, I was here last year. I mean, that's really not the focus that you want to have. So I would say the tour is not optional. Go for it. Um, get get um, good shoes because they all are going to tour you, and they're going to tour you around the entire facility and hospital and uh, smile nicely and listen to what's being said. Great. Our next question, um, how does the voting procedure work exactly when deciding on each applicant? Uh, do the interviewers try to convince a separate committee? Um, and then a uh, kind of follow up to this, you mentioned the behind the scenes discussion following applicant interviews. Can you elaborate more on this? Yeah, I mean, how voting is done is completely school dependent, you know, so, um, you know, but I think most voting is done you know, when everyone who's on the committee, certainly everyone who interviewed the students for that week are present, and there's usually a consensus drawn during that meeting. But again, how voting is done is dependent, number one, on a school, if the school has rolling admissions or not, and number two, just on sort of the school-specific um, policies and sort of procedures. Um, 
behind the scenes discussions, um, these are really important. I mean, you know, your interviewers are potentially going to fill out forms about you, sort of summarizing what happened during that interview, what their impressions were. Um, but, you know, almost all medical schools have behind the scenes meetings where all the applicants either for that day or that week are discussed. The, the files are pulled, either hard copy, but more commonly now um, on, on computer. And every applicant is discussed in detail. And, um, you know, and this is when your interviewers will pipe in about, you know, what makes you a great applicant, what make you know, maybe what are the potential problems in your candidacy. And fundamentally, there usually is a vote. Who wants to take this person? Who doesn't want to take this person? And again, if, if an interviewer feels really strongly about your candidacy, whether that be positive or negative, it's unlikely that someone's going to contradict them. Um, you know, so those, those behind the scenes discussions are really important. And I would just add, if there's a lot of consensus, either on the high end, being positive, you know, we all felt really positively about this person, we think they're extremely strong, or on the low end, if there's consensus that really this person is not a great fit. There's, there may not be a ton of discussion. Now again, like Jessica said, there's so much um, variability among schools and how this process plays out. So sometimes the people who are kind of more in the middle or, you know, they had one really strong interview, one not so strong, those might be the people where there's a lot of discussion. All right, our next question. Um, how should I address flaws in my application, such as poor grades? Should this be the focus of my interview? It depends. <laughs> and that, that's a really general question. I mean, one poor grade, it doesn't really matter. I mean, typically, um, you know, and poor grades freshman and sophomore year with an upward trend, very, very typical. We see this all the time. You know, a lot of students take, you know, a little while to adjust to college and they typically will improve as they go through college. So I don't, I don't think there's sort of a one size fits all answer to this type of question. Um, it really depends. You, you, if, if you have really bad grades, you're not getting medical school interviews. So they can't be that bad. Um, you know, if it's, you know, let's say you just had a horrible, horrible year one year. Um, yeah, you should try to bring it up. You don't, you don't want it to be, you never want it to be the focus, but you certainly want to bring up a red flag if it's something that someone on the admissions committee is potentially going to identify, and they're going to say to your interviewer, "Hey, you know, this person had a 2.0 their junior year. What happened?" And if your interviewer doesn't have a defense for that and doesn't have an explanation, then you're in trouble. You know, so. The, the, these sorts of things really need to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. I agree, Jess. I think that um, you obviously have to meet a certain academic criteria to even get the interview. So if your grades are really that bad, you're not sitting in that interview seat. Um, the other thing, though, is that I think that the focus of, let's say, having a bad semester or a bad class should also be on what you learned from that experience. That's what I kind of call falling on the sword. So I mean it happened, but instead of um, excusing it away, I think a better perspective or a better way to position that would be, but this is what I learned. This is what I learned from that entire experience. So that would be the, if you're going to focus on the bad grade, focus on what you learned, um, you know, what did you take away from that, and then how did you improve upon that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Great. Uh, next question is for the MMI. Would you recommend? I'm sorry. Would you recommend practicing scenarios in preparation? And where would I be able to find practice scenarios? I definitely recommend practicing. Um, finding scenarios is a challenge, and honestly, I haven't been able to find a really great resource for scenarios, which is one of the reasons why it sort of is on our agenda to create that resource. Um, you know, but you should definitely practice and sort of understand that a lot of these scenarios, they're not sophisticated scenarios. They're, they're not medical scenarios. They're, they're really scenarios that you have encountered in your everyday life um, that sort of present issues or dilemma or, you know, ethical questions. Um, but if you find a great resource, let us know. Let, let the other students know because I think this is something that everyone is sort of really thirsty for. 
There are, if you if you simply Google though, you know, MMI inter medical school interviews, there are a lot of articles about the MMI, and in those articles, they will give you examples of the types of scenarios or questions. Um, and I, so I, I think reading, at least reading an article to familiarize yourself, I think will really help you anticipate what this format is going to be. I think the format can throw people off really more than the actual questions. So familiarize yourself with the format by reading, you know, some articles about it. And also there's some videos that show students, you know, moving through an MMI uh, interview. And so I think sort of, you know, again, that anticipatory guidance for yourself can really go a long way toward demystifying the process. Yeah. yeah. Right. I agree because I think the problem or the issue that's that's felt with the MMI is that many of these questions or scenarios don't really have a right or wrong answer. Right. They're, it's much more about the logic and how you've thought through it. Uh -huh. right. And so I think people focus on, oh, I, I really want to do it the right way and give them the right answer. Well, but but it, it's exactly what Lori was saying. What's it's about the process not so much at the end results. So right. if you can just practice the process, I think you're going to be in good shape. Yeah, and sometimes when we do practice mock practice MMI interviews with applicants, you know, we propose a scenario and they just they want to spit out an answer. It's like, no, 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 it's not about the answer. It's about how you got to that answer. You know, so so exactly what, you know, Lisa and Lori said, it, you know, it's a, it's about the process how you're getting there. It's not about spitting out an answer and that's why there really isn't a right or wrong answer as long as you substantiate and um, you know sort of offer a good reason um, for whatever your argument might be or your position you know you're right okay next question if the interview has if the interviewer has viewed our application do they usually ask us to elaborate on certain parts of the application Yes. <laughs> um, and again, this is about the interviewer style, right? Some, some schools actually have, you know, a set list of questions they want everyone to ask. Not, not many, but some. Um, but typically an interviewer, whether or whether, you know, if they, if they have your application in front of them or if they've looked at it, sure, something that sparks their interest they might ask about specifically and you have to sort of be prepared for that. Again, this really depends on the individual style of the interviewer. I think this is also a good reminder to um, just reemphasize something that you said, Jess, which is before every interview, I encourage all of you to go back and read your application. You don't want to be caught off guard by the person who did read it, highlight it, and make notes in the column about it. Um, so definitely be aware as to what it is that you wrote. I know that you guys spent so many weeks and months preparing it, but it's always a good idea just to review it a few days before. Um, each of your um, specific interviews. Okay. Um, is carrying a water bottle or drinking water to combat dry mouth acceptable in an interview scenario? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think I think sometimes applicants get a little bit too hung up on sort of these nitty gritties. What can I carry? What can I carry? As long as your cell phone's out of sight, right? And you know, not within earshot. Um, you know. Of course you should carry a water bottle. That's perfectly fine. There is no explanation needed if you have some type of medical condition or, you know, you get nervous and you get dry mouth. It's not necessary. You know, your interviewers are human, right? They probably have a water bottle too, you know? So it's absolutely, if there's something, you know, you can carry a purse, you can, you know, carry what whatever you want to carry as long as it sort of doesn't have the, you know, the contents of your life inside it. Um, so absolutely, I think that's perfectly acceptable. Great. I agree. All right, next we have, what are some appropriate questions to ask the interviewer if I'm given the opportunity to ask questions? How do I know I'm not crossing the line when I'm asking questions to the interviewer? What I always like to tell people is, you know, because everyone thinks that they have to ask questions at an end of an interview, at the end of an interview. And as an interviewer, we sort of all know that you're inundated with information over the course of the interview day. So frankly, when I used to interview, I didn't really expect my applicants to have questions, but they all felt obligated to ask questions. I prefer that these questions are sincere, okay, that there's something about your interests. You know, let's say you have a specific interest in some specific type of research and you can ask about that. 
or you know there's something that let's say you learned about on the tour that piqued your curiosity you can ask them about that um, you know so try to make those questions genuine and sort of not you know something that you had in your back pocket ready to kind of throw out when when you knew you were going to get that okay what questions do you have for me at the end of the interview make them sincere make them truthful um, and you know in terms of crossing the line again this is about using your judgment um, you know if an interviewer said oh yeah you know I went to med school it was great here I loved it you know but when I was here da 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 if let's say they bring that up over the course of the interview it's okay to say you know well what did you like most about the school right so you you're, you know you're crossing the line if you're sort of let's say bringing something up that they didn't bring up okay and I, again this is about using your judgment I think it's always um, interesting to ask the interviewer you know depending on what their position is but you know tell me about the students here what do you think the students are like you know what do they seem to really do when they're not in class um, what do you like about teaching the students here um, can you describe sort of the feel or the culture just to get you know their perspective on that great our next question says, I know you said not to worry about time limits and to rehearse answers. However, for the tell me about yourself question, how long would a good response be? Tell me about yourself is one of those questions that we go over on every mock interview because someone on the interview trail is going to ask you this question, if not everybody. All right. Everyone sort of has their own way of answering this question. Some of them will answer this question chronologically. Some people will answer it based on sort of outlining their specific interests. Um, you know, you, you certainly, this is about paying attention to your interviewer again. You know, if you have a listener, you can talk for five, ten minutes and give them your entire life story, you know, and they'll be perfectly happy, right? If you get someone who's a little bit, let's say, not as patient and sort of really as eager to ask you questions, you need to kind of get a sense of that if they're getting bored, if they, if you feel like you're talking for too long. I, I do like people for a tell me about yourself type of question to kind of have a few bullet points um, in terms of the things that they want to highlight um, and and talk about during that question. I I sort of I like to think of that question as like a platter you're presenting to your interviewer of your experiences. So you don't talk about anything in too much detail but you just sort of present a bunch of things and that sort of then gives your interviewer the opportunity to sort of pick and choose from that platter as they want. I think it's also really important in this answer to include some personal information, some references about where you've lived or right. you know, things your family is involved with, your parents perhaps, or you know, important people in your life because you're looking to connect. And so if someone is like, oh, you know, well, I went to college there too, or I grew up there too, I think they they it makes that the interviewer feel a connection to you. So definitely give some details. Um, like Jess was saying, not too many details about your activities. You don't want to go into you know, great detail about why well, I did this and this and this and go through your entire AMCAS application on all of your activities, but pick out a couple and give them you know, the names and, and the, um, you know, where you did this or what the research project was so that they can then ask follow-ups. This makes their job really easy. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question asks, should you bring copies of your resume to refer to during the interview, for example, um, giving how many hours you spent on a particular activity? No. <laughs> this, this is all in your application, you know, and assuming you've been honest on your application, um, there, there's no need to bring a, a resume um, hours spent. That, that's all there. If you have updates, you know, if let's say, you had a recent publication that just came out last week. Um, you can potentially bring a copy of that paper um, and, you know, give it to the admissions committee, not necessarily your interviewer, but the, you know, the admissions director, whoever sort of is in running the office. But there, there's no need to bring any sort of copies of what would be considered admissions documents. Okay. Um, what advice would you have regarding preparing for both types of interviews if you're not naturally an extrovert? First of all, you know, it wouldn't be great if every doctor was an extrovert. <laughs> I think interviews are sort of easier for extroverts, but I think that all three of us can attest to the fact that we've, you know, we've accepted a lot of introverts, okay? 
Um, and so I think if you're not comfortable speaking with other people, especially sitting down with someone new and talking about yourself, which is something that I think a lot of us don't do very often and in some ways kind of unnatural, um, you know, just practice. Just practice like sitting down with anyone and just talking about yourself. And that will just kind of, you know, You'll, you'll sort of just get used to that, but you never want to try to be somebody whom you're not. You know, so if you're an introvert, don't for that day try to act like you're an extrovert because we can sort of always sense when things are kind of just not quite right. I would also add if you're um, a student, you know, you've never had a job interview or, or any kind of interview, or you've had limited interviewing experience, and you do have a little bit of, you know, trepidation, definitely, you know, do, do the practicing. Um, there are a lot of, of interviewees now who have been out in the work world for one, two, five years, and they're very, they're mature. They've had more life experiences, and it makes this process a bit easier. So mm -hmm. it, I think it, it is important to practice if you feel that you have not been put in, into these situations before. Great. Our next question asks, what should I wear to an interview? Is it possible to look too professional and uptight? I can lead off on this. I, yeah, are we all still here? <laughs> I, I tell people, you, you need to be comfortable. Um, I mean, absolutely look professional. I don't know that it's possible to look too professional, but I think it's possible to look uptight if you're not comfortable in the clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so be comfortable, but you definitely don't want to be an outlier. You want to fit in, and everyone's wearing their dark suit, you know. But I think putting something on that's, you know, a piece of jewelry or a nice tie that maybe has some color to it, it can help people remember you. So, you know, fit in, but have something that offers a little bit of sense of who you are and something that makes you feel good and confident. And also be yourself in how you dress. I mean, you know, and then for women, you know, stay away from high heels, stay away from short skirts, obviously, um, you know, but be who you are. And, and, you know, as I think I said during the talk, you know, envision what a professional is to you. You know, when you walk into a doctor's office, you know, minus the white coat, what would you want your your doctor to look like? And try to look like that person. Um, and I think sort of looking too uptight, I don't think that's a look. I think that is sort of more of an attitude. You know, there's some people who sort of just, regardless of what they're wearing, they're uptight, you know? <laughs> and so I don't think it has as much to do with attire as, as that has to do with attitude. My words of advice is that you should be remembered for what you're saying than what you're wearing. Yeah, right. That's always a good one, yeah. Agreed. Very good. Um, the next question says, I know this does not relate to the actual interview itself, but overall, at what GPA cutoff will an interview for sure be considered or not be given? It's impossible to say because there are so many variables that go into this. Um, you know, there are people who have a GPA of 3.2 but an MCAT of 40, and they get into a U.S. medical school, U.S. allopathic medical school. There's, you know, there might be, you know, there, there are different criteria for different, um, for different groups. So, you know, an underrepresented minority or someone who has had tremendous disadvantage is going to have a, you know, a, you know, different balance of GPA and MCAT. So I, I think, you know, sort of the, the overarching sort of cutoff that people think of is 3.5, but there, there's a lot of variation in, in that GPA. And again, some people can have freshman, sophomore year GPAs that are terrible, and then they just, you know, skyrocket junior and senior year. So I think it's tough to really give a definitive answer to that question. And there's great data from the AAMC and the MSAR. Um, you can see the range of GPAs that were accepted. Um, so I think you have to be realistic, but but like Jess was saying, this is one variable, and we, and we don't know your whole story, so or the whole story in this particular situation. So. Um, you know, be realistic, but look at the data. Yeah, right. All right, this may be our last question. We might have time for one more. Um, how many students are typically interviewed on one interview day? Is it a small group or a large group? 
again, that depends on the school. You know, some schools are going to have, you know, numerous small interview days, and others are going to have, a, you know, a smaller number of huge interview days. You know, so I'd say, and it also depends on when in the season. You know, once you get towards the end of the season, like, you know, February, March, April, you know, the days are typically there are not many applicants interviewing. You know, when you're at the peak of the season, which I consider to be like October, November, December, January, those interview days are potentially going to be pretty full. I'd, I'd say on average, probably between anywhere between 10 and 15 for most schools. But yeah. again, there's there's tremendous variation. Okay. Um, should I try to make small jokes if given the chance to make myself seem less serious, or does that make me sound unprofessional? Again, it depends on the situation. <laughs> And it depends if you really have a good sense of humor or not. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be really good or it could be really bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's a hard one to know. That's tough because you know what? People with great sense of humor are also super smart, right? So, I mean, that completely depends on who you are and what the situation is. Okay. But I think it's fine to be animated, I would say. You know, oh, yeah. you don't have to be stiff and, and super formal. Um, but, oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a tricky thing you, to you, you want to smile. I mean, you you know, you want to be human. You know, right. they're, they, 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 they're, they're accepting you because they want good human beings in their class, and they want we want good human beings taking care of our patients in the future. Right. You know, so, so you, you want to be human is, is really the bottom line. Okay, and this one will be our last question. Um, how long after your secondary application submission so should you start worrying about not hearing anything yet? Well, that also depends because it depends on when you submitted your application. I mean, if you submitted your application, um, you know, on, on June 5th, right, and you completed your secondary by July 10th and you haven't heard anything yet, that might be slightly concerning. But if you just submitted your application, let's say, you know, in September and you didn't complete the secondary until October, you're you're pretty you're you're pretty, you know, you're kind of far down the line. So you might not be hearing from that school. So that also is a really there's a lot that, you know, kind of would go into that. Okay. Well I think that's gonna wrap us up for the evening. Um, Thank you to all of you from MedEdits for spending some time with us this evening and um, answering questions and sharing your wisdom. Um, and thanks to all of you in the audience who took an hour out of your evening to spend with us. We hope it was helpful to you. Um, a couple of quick notes. Um, first, if we didn't get to your question, we will be posting a list of the unanswered questions in the pre-med forums on studentdoctor.net um, so that the MedEdits team, as well as others who have been through this process before, can answer and, and discuss those questions. Um, second, if you want to hear any of this again or to share it with others, we'll be posting it on the Student Doctor YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Um, so you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter uh, to find out when that will be available. Um, we'll be posting it there as well. Um, and thanks again, and we hope you all have a great evening. And thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you.